we're, we're rejoicing to be together in, in the presence of the Lord and being able to hear from his voice, from his word. So let's, let's go before him in prayer before we study the scriptures. Father, we thank you for the truths that we just sang, that Calvary covers it all, and that we cling to the old rugged cross, and that is the, the cornerstone of our faith. And we thank you that you are a saving God, and your salvation is not merely something to take us to heaven one day, but you're in the business of changing lives now. And you want to change our lives now. And so we pray that you would use this scripture that we study this morning. We pray that, that you would use it in our lives for, for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. And I pray that we would be thoroughly equipped for every good work as a result of meeting with you this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yesterday, I listened to a podcast of a, a testimony of a woman who is, who is now an apologist. She, she's a defender of the, of the Christian faith, but she was raised in a, uh, a, an atheistic household. And so she was, she was raised by, by, by parents who encouraged her very much and modeled a, an atheistic worldview. They, they, they didn't see a purpose, a point in, in religion, and, uh, and they didn't believe there was a God. And anyway, uh, she came from... That background, when she went off to college, went off to university, she said that uh, she began having doubts about her faith, her atheistic beliefs. And she began to doubt, what if there is a God? And, and began to wonder and wrestle with, with, with different aspects of, of, uh, of uh, uh, the possibility of a God. And through a series of events, uh, uh, she came to, to uh, believe in Jesus Christ and she came to and met with a pastor and uh, he led her in a sinner's prayer led her in a prayer of salvation and she prayed this prayer uh, she came to to a new faith in Christ and she was excited about it the Bible was a brand new book uh, she, she's learning things she had not known before and she was going to come to this church and she came to the church and uh, as a college student I, you know she just had what she had to, you know in terms of, of things to wear uh, uh, clothing and and, and so she came to church not quite conforming to the uh, church. And she said it was one thing to meet Jesus. It was another thing to meet the church. Because she came there and the pastor's wife immediately came up to her, looked at her and said, Honey, we've got to dress you differently. And she, she was just taken back like, what? You know, wouldn't you start by saying, we heard that you came to faith in Jesus. We're praising God. And, and boy, we hope you can be encouraged here. But honey, you need to dress differently. Um, and so she said it was. It kind of was a uh, a difficult thing, as it kind of you know brought her down a little bit. And and she had to to learn to deal with with some of the things that she encountered in the church. And as I listened to that, I thought, you know, oftentimes we in Christian circles we get to be our own little sub subculture. And uh, there's, the sub, there's the culture of the world out here, and then we have our own little Christian subculture, a little bubble where we do things certain ways, we've got certain procedures, certain ways that we dress, certain ways that we talk, certain music we listen to, whatever, and we've, we've got all of our little things that we do. And many times that subculture, the main ingredients, really don't have much to do with Scripture. They've got a whole lot more to do with just the way we like things to be. And uh, she stepped into a subculture like that and was shocked <laughs> at what she saw. Well, Jesus, when he came and he began to minister in Israel, he came to a religious subculture uh, for many of the conservative Jews of his day. Uh, and, and as he came to them, he confronted them. Now, as, as you think about a Christian subculture, there are some things that, that draw us. It, it, it affirms a person who, who, who embraces it and who conforms to it. It makes you feel like you're part of a group. Um, it can make you feel like, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I've trusted in Jesus. Now I'm trying to follow all the, all the, all the rules and the traditions and the, and the, the, the behavioral traits. And, and it makes me feel like I'm okay. I'm accepted. And so you see where that, that's, that's, you know, that's uh, affirming to a person. But it misses the main point. On the other hand, there's a thing called biblical righteousness. 
And that's what Scripture testifies to. It's a standard of righteousness that's so much higher. It's a completely different category than the cultural right, righteousness many of us just conform to. And uh, it's that righteousness that God is concerned about. A genuine holiness, righteousness. It, when, we, when we see his righteousness in all of its glory and all of its splendor, it drives us to our knees. Uh, that's when we say, I'm unworthy. I, I'm a sinful person and I come from people that, that, that are in a sinful culture. And it, it's, it's distressing at first, but it drives us to him in a humble faith. And when Jesus reaches down in his grace and saves us, it starts becoming exciting. It is absolutely exciting because all of a sudden there's another, another level, there's a whole other realm of living which is called real, genuine righteousness and holiness. And that is what I think Jesus is driving at as he speaks in the Sermon on the Mount uh, in, in Matthew chapter 5. And if you're not there, I would encourage you to turn there. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is confronting this religious subculture. And he makes a statement in chapter 5, verse 20. He says, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, who were, they were meticulous biblical scholars who, who tried to, to follow every single detail of command that they could find in the Old Testament. And Jesus says, you know, that's its own subculture. And unless you have a righteousness that goes way beyond them to a different league, a different level, a whole different nature of righteousness, you're never even going to enter heaven. Well, that had to have gotten people's attention because if the scribes and Pharisees weren't at a level where they would go to heaven, who in the world would be? And Jesus is presenting himself, who's going to be the Savior, who's going to make a way that we can go to heaven. So he, he's, he's showing us the true standard of what righteousness and holiness is. And he's going through, he starts going through, verses 21 and following, uh, different aspects of what these people had been taught. Because their Bible teachers would go, go into the Scriptures and they would say, okay, this is what the Scripture means, and, and here's what it means here, and here's what it means, and they would teach it. And Jesus is telling them, you've been getting it all wrong, and your teachers have been giving it to you wrong. The scribes, the Pharisees, I'm telling you, there's something else going on here than what they're telling you. And so he goes through several examples of Old Testament teaching showing what true righteousness looks like. The first one we looked at dealing with the command that you shall not murder. And the Pharisees said, well, yeah, you shouldn't murder. And as, as long as you don't do the actual act of killing, you're okay. Jesus says, not so. If you've got hatred and anger in your heart, you've got the same disposition of heart that a murderer does. And you're going to be liable to judgment. And then he goes to the next command, you shall not commit adultery. And again, the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders said, as long as you don't do the actual act of adultery, as long as you don't actually do it, you're okay. Jesus said, not so, because it comes down to the heart. If your heart is looking at a woman and lusting for her, you've got the same heart of a person who commits adultery, and you're going to be liable to judgment. And then in verse 31, he comes to the third uh, contrast where he contrasts what they've been taught with what God really expects. And it's another one of those subjects that I'm thinking, oh man, of all the things I don't want to preach on this Sunday, divorce. But that's where Jesus goes. In the Sermon on the Mount is a hard-hitting sermon where he, he is striking very much at, at the, the religious subculture and showing us what true righteousness is. Now let me say this. This is a very controversial subject. If you don't know it by now, I'd be surprised. It's a very emotional subject. And uh, people have very strong opinions and strong emotions because of past experiences. And uh, this is the type of a subject that can make some, if they've never been divorced, feel kind of self-righteous. Like, well, you know, I've never done that and I would never do that. And boy, the people who do, they're bad. It can make others feel angry. Maybe you, you've been in a situation, grew up in a situation perhaps where your parents divorced or where a spouse left you, and there's anger. Other people may feel guilt as they look at past decisions that they regret, that they wish they could change. Others feel pain and hurt, uh, sometimes not just from interactions with a former spouse, but interactions in the Christian subculture where they've been pounded on and made feel like second-class citizens. So there's all kinds of emotions here. 
But I want you to know my goal is to simply be faithful to the Lord Jesus, speak with truth and grace, and I want to motivate you to move toward him. That's my goal. That's my heart. And I want you to leave with hope. So don't jump up and run right out the door. I've seen that before, too, when I've preached on this subject. Um, and I, I, I'll trust that I won't drive you out the door. But what I want to do is show you what Jesus is saying. But realize in the larger scope, he's simply painting what righteousness truly is. And in every area of life, God's righteousness is so high, it is so exalted, that it drives us all to our knees saying, I need the cross. I need the Savior. I need you. And that's where it should drive us. So, let's dig in. Let's look at this, this, this subject. Now, Jesus, let me just read the verses to you. Verse 31 and 32. Jesus says, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So let's talk a little bit about what they had heard. Now this is Jesus' words on marriage and divorce. He says, this is what you've been taught, basically, and it's this, whoever divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. That's basically the message that they've been receiving from their biblical teachers. Incomplete message. Jesus is going to show that. Incorrect message. Now, as you just look at that statement, what do you notice about it that stands out? Um, it does come from a passage of Scripture, but this is not a quotation from Scripture. The last two have quoted different uh, of the Ten Commandments. This one is simply a paraphrase, and it comes from one passage, Deuteronomy 24. And I'll turn you there in just a minute, but let's not go there yet. Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 4. And the reason that's the only, only passage in the entire Pentateuch, the first five books, that's the books of the law of the Old Testament. That, that was the basis of their law for their society, for their lives in, in, in the Old Testament times in Israel. This is the only passage that talks about divorce. So whatever they were going to draw out of that had to come from that one passage. There's very few passages in the Old Testament that deal with it. There's Malachi 2.16 where, where God says, I hate divorce. There's Ezra chapter 10 where there's an issue where there's intermarrying with the, with the pagan people and they had to deal with that. And that's about it in the Old Testament in terms of, of human beings getting divorced. Um, so as you look at it, it comes from that passage. As you look at this phrasing, whoever divorces his wife must give her. What perspective is this coming from? It's the man, totally, right? It's totally from the man's perspective. He's got all the power. He's got all the authority. He makes the decisions. The assumption was that a man would be the one divorcing the wife. And in the Middle East, very male-dominated culture, uh, a woman often viewed as property, uh, divorce would be the man's decision. And there'd be no legal uh, processes, no hearing. Uh, he would simply state, you're divorced, and that would be it. And in that culture, for a woman to be let go from a husband, from a marriage, where would she go? There wasn't a whole lot of career options in that day and age for a woman, and she would have been in a desperate situation. So that would give a man real ability to control the relationship. If the woman didn't, didn't, didn't go along with what he wanted, do you want to be divorced? Uh, no. And it just gives him complete control. It also looks pretty permissive, doesn't it? Whoever divorces his wife. It doesn't say anything about conditions, uh, what circumstances would be allowed. No restrictions mentioned. And the Jews, the majority of Jews, had very permissible views. What is the passage that this is drawn from talking about? Deuteronomy 24. And I apologize, it's going to be small, but I had to get the whole thing on there, otherwise we're not going to see where it's going. So hopefully you can see it. If not, uh, maybe you can turn to Deuteronomy 24 in your Bible. What it says, when you're looking at this, this is not giving a comprehensive teaching on divorce. 
is giving one specific scenario, and it's a complicated one. This is, this is case law, legal case law. It, it looks like something a lawyer would want to, to look at. But if you look at it, the structure of it, you've got an if, if, then. And let me show you. Right up there in the upper left-hand corner, you've got an if. If, and then later on, another if. And at the last phrase, it says, if this happens, if this happens, then this may not happen. So let's just read it. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and if he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand, sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her, he then also writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, sends her out of his house, or if that latter man dies, who took her to be his wife. Okay, that's a lot of stuff. That lady's had a rough time, right? If all this stuff happens, then, and this is the only command here, the former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife. So boiling the whole thing down, if a man divorces his wife and she goes marry somebody else, God is saying, that's it. You can never take her back to be your wife again. That's what that's saying. What's the point of that? I think it was probably to prevent husbands from using these easy divorce laws to swap wives. You know, is it, okay, you're talking to your buddy, I'll divorce my wife, you divorce yours, we'll, we'll each marry the other one, we'll live that way for a while, see if we like it, if we don't, we'll just divorce them again and take them back. No. God is regulating divorce. This is not his ideal. He's simply trying to take sinful human beings and saying, okay, I'm going to try to corral this as much as we can. This is not God's ideal. This is a way of regulating sinful human beings. That's what this passage is meant to be. So what did the scribes and Pharisees do? There's one phrase, you see it in the, in the blue highlight there, some indecency. The Pharisees looked at that and they said, well, this passage simply applies, implies some kind of divorce. And it talks about it, some indecency. What does it mean by an indecency? And so it turned into a discussion, a debate about what did that mean? And uh, the, the Hebrew phrase is ervat er davar. Uh, it literally means a, a nakedness uh, of a thing or a shame of a thing. So something shameful. But the meaning is really unclear. It's an obscure phrase. It couldn't have referred to adultery because in the Old Testament law, the penalty for that would have been death. Here, she's being divorced and remarried, but it probably had something to do with some kind of a sexual sin, you would think. But the debate went on and on, what does it mean? And so the, the Pharisees were interested in, what are the grounds? What allows a man to say bye to his wife? Well, in the Mishnah, which is a collection of, 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 of Jewish writings which reflected the debates which were common in Jesus' time, uh, it, it says that there were two different schools of thought. One was the hardliners, the strict ones, and they were, they were uh, affiliated to, with a, a rabbi named Shammai, and they believed this was only for sexual sin. That was the only grounds. The other school was the looser one, the more permissive one, uh, with Rabbi Hillel, and they said it could be almost anything. Trivial offenses, like spoiling a meal. Like, even if the husband found somebody else who was more attractive, he could just say bye to his wife, you're gone, I divorce you, and take somebody else. And it seems that most Jews in Jesus' day held this looser view. Um, Jesus is going to discuss the same issue in Matthew chapter 19, and we're not going to go there quite yet. We will later. But in uh, Matthew 19, 17, uh, the Jews even saw this passage as a command that if a man found an indecency in his wife, he must divorce her. So you begin to see how you can take Scripture and begin to just mash it into what you want it to say. And that's what they were doing. But this passage does not say anything about acceptable grounds. It does not give anything other than a procedure. Uh, it doesn't even really give a procedure to follow. It simply restricts the amount of divorce and marriage that can happen in a wicked society. That's what it's saying. So, that is what the people have been taught. Okay? 
Uh, a man can divorce his wife, and if he does so, give her a certificate. And that is really not what Deuteronomy 24 is saying. So what does Jesus have to say about the matter? This is what we really want to get at. What does he say? First thing he's, he's getting at, I think there's three things we can grab onto. Have a high view of marriage. Hold a high view of marriage. That's where it starts. And this underlies everything that Jesus says in this passage. It's a high view of marriage. And there's a principle here. When we're dealing with any issue, and I'll illustrate it in a few minutes, with any issue in Scripture, you start with God's ideal. Then you might consider an exception. But you start with the ideal. You don't start with the exceptions to, to, uh, to, to God's principles. And so, in this case, start with the sanctity of marriage, not with grounds for divorce. So what is biblical marriage? Now I want you to turn to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Jesus is hit with a question here about the same issue. And Matthew, in writing his book, knew that he was coming to this and he would develop it more fully. And so I think he, he was intending us to read these two passages together. But the Pharisees, chapter 19, verse 3 Verse 3, the Pharisees came up to Jesus and they tested him. So already it's not a sincere question. They're trying to make him say something which will get him in trouble. And quite frankly, where he was, if you look back in verse 1, was in a region of Judea by the Jordan. He was in a place called Perea where, where a ruler named Herod was. Herod was the one who arrested John who condemned him because he was living with his brother's wife. And, uh, and, and John wound up be, becoming beheaded. He was executed there. And so Jesus is in the same territory where that ruler rules. And they're trying to bait him to say something about divorce, I think. So the Pharisees come up and test him, saying, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Permissible? And at this point, Jesus, when he answers, he does not start with arguing exceptions, reasons for divorce, he goes back to the fundamental truth of the sanctity of marriage. Look at what he says. And I've got this on a PowerPoint too. This one's a little bit bigger, so hopefully it'll be a little more re readable. But he says, and, and let, me, let me say this as well, um, when Jesus speaks about marriage and lays down the principles of what marriage is, um, in our day and age, there's a lot of discussion especially among professing Christians and in churches and denominations. What is biblical marriage? How do we define marriage? Should we define it differently, more broadly? Uh, can it involve uh, you know, two men or two women as well as a man and a woman? And, and you hear these discussions going, and these people talk as though Jesus never defined marriage. Not so. Right there. Look at what he says, powerful words. And Jesus, when they ask him about divorce, he doesn't go to Deuteronomy. Where does he go? Genesis chapters 1 and 2 to the original design. That's what I mean. Go back to the original design, not just exceptions. Jesus is saying, uh, when he goes to these passages, he's saying that these chapters, Genesis 1 and 2, are not just descriptive. That's what a lot of people in our day and age, a lot of denominations are claiming. That Genesis 1 and 2 simply says that for those two people, it was a man and a woman, but this is not meant to be the pattern. But Jesus says right here, it is meant to be the pattern. It's not just descriptive, it's pre scriptive. This is God's intent. This is God's design. And that's what Jesus says about it. And I think modern discussions on redefining marriage would do very well to follow Jesus' example right here. Matthew 19, verse 4. So, let's see what Jesus says. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Okay, I already hear a fight going if we're out on the street saying this. But that's exactly what it says. And then Jesus says that God said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Again, he's saying the same thing. He, he's, 
he's talking about complementary partners, a man and a woman who, who, are, who are the same, uh, share humanity, and yet there's a profound distinction between them. There is diversity there. That's a good word in our world, isn't it? Everybody's talking about diversity. Well, we're for diversity, especially in marriage, right? Um, and the two, Jesus says it that way, the two. He's added these words. That's not what it says in the Old Testament, but Jesus adds it to emphasize it, to underline it. And those two, the man and the woman, they shall become one flesh. And then he makes this statement, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, is marriage just a cultural thing? Something that we just do as a culture, just because, it's just kind of evolved, and governments are the ones who de declare somebody to be, no. What God has joined together, let men not separate. So, so looking at this, as Jesus goes right through what marriage is, three things jump out, and just boom, they just hit us. One is that marriage is between one man and one woman. One man, one woman. He also says God is the one who joins the man and the woman in marriage for life. It's an act of God. When a couple comes together, who marries them? Well, the pastor does in some ways. I remember one time saying, you know, to my kids I was going, that, I, that I'd married somebody, and they said, well, how did you marry them both? And I said, no, I didn't marry them, but I married them and joining them in marriage. But really, I didn't. God married them. God joins them the couple together. And then the third thing, man does not have the authority to annul, to dissolve something that God has done. That's what Jesus is getting at here. So the high view of marriage. Now, why is a permanent heterosexual marriage so important that God, right at the beginning of the creation of, of the human race, established this? three reasons I want to give you. First, it honors God. It honors God. God created human beings in his own image. And in that passage, Genesis 1, 27, it says, God created us in the image of God, in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them male and female. Right there. Talking about us being created in the image of God, right in the same context, it says the male-female design. And I don't know how all of this works out, but something about the male-female design, and especially male-female union in marriage, does reflect God's own character. That's part of being in the image of God. I suspect it may have something to do with the fact that God himself is a plurality. And as we read through the scriptures later on, we, we see that, that, that there's a trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit involved in, if we can use the terminology, almost as it were a, a holy, divine marriage. A love relationship is, which is gone for all eternity. And maybe by, by, by coupling human beings in, in marriages, there's something of that that reflects God's character. That's what I suspect. I suspect also that's why Satan so hates it, the male-female union in marriage, and attacks it. And he's done through all through history, not just in our day and age, all through history. So it honors God. Another reason why the, the permanent heterosexual marriage is so important, it's a covenant relationship. Marriage is a covenant relationship. It's, a, it's built on a, on a vow before God. Marriage is not built upon emotions, feelings, romance, but a vow. I've got several vows that I allow couples to choose between if I'm going to do a marriage with them. And I tell you what, when, when the, uh, uh, sometimes, it's usually the bride in my experience, uh, we would like to write our own vows. I kind of go gulp. Uh, because I've gotten those before, and they write them, and it's, it looks like a Hallmark card. I love you so much. My life has never been like this until I've met you, and you make me feel so wonderful. I want to spend my life with you. And I've had several times where we've had the conversation, this is not a vow. 
This is a love letter, okay? You need to make a vow, promise something. And then we start going back to the vows that I have. We start trying to pull those elements into it because marriage is built on a vow, on a promise. Feelings and emotions come and go. A promise is set. It's established. And that is what is best for marriage. And when a couple gets married, they're saying, we are going to work through problems. We're not going to run from them. Back door is closed. There's no escape hatch. We're going to go forward together in this. And that's what marriage is built upon. This is the problem when couples live together first. And that's a common thing. I, I read a stat this week. As, estimated 70% of couples now live together to try it out before they get married. What's wrong with that picture? It's a conditional relationship now. There's not been a decision made. And once they start living together, then they start paying bills together. There's all sorts of, of, of social pressures that kind of push them together, and they've never really made a decision yet, and they just start feeling squashed together, and they just kind of float into marriage without a real decision. And the statistics tell us they are 50. People who, co who cohabit first are 50% more likely to divorce than people who don't. So it's not... Good. Marriage is built upon a commitment. Third reason why this design of marriage is so important, this is God's context for sex and for the raising of children. Um, sex is a wonderful gift from God, marvelous gift from Him. It's powerful. It's binding. It binds people together. And when sex is taken out of the marriage commitment and is put into other relationships, um, it becomes casual. It becomes cheap. It binds people in ways that they're not meant to be bound outside of marriage. People in our world oftentimes accuse Christians of having a low view of sex. No, it's the opposite. We have a high view of sex. That's why it's restricted to certain contexts. When you have something valuable, you take care of it, and you use it only in certain contexts. And that's the way we view sex. Now, uh, heterosexual activity is also how children are conceived. And so God's design is that children are to be raised in the context of a marriage between a husband and a wife. In studies, I'm not even going to bother going that direction right now this morning, but studies show that children are far healthier, far more likely to succeed when they're raised with a loving father and mother because they both bring something to the equation. They see how a relationship works, and then they're equipped for their own marriages as well. So there's many reasons why this is so, so important. Now let me say this. This does not mean that every human being is meant to be married it does not mean that every married couple will be able to conceive and bear children, but this is God's pattern, right? That's his pattern. But he can bless in lives, you know, where it's not that, that case uh, for his own purposes as well. So the Pharisees in chapter 19 immediately come back because they don't like Jesus' answer. They say, verse 7, Why then did Moses command that a man give a certific certificate of divorce to his wife and send her away? And Jesus comes right back, it's not a command. Moses permitted. He allowed you to divorce your wives because of hardness of heart, but that's not the way it was from the beginning. So, Deuteronomy 24 is not the main passage. Genesis 1 and 2 is the main passage. So, back to our outline. Hold a high view of marriage. Then, Understand the implications of divorce. What are the implications then? If this is a, what marriage is all about, it's a union, a, a covenant between a man and a woman, and God joins them together, and we don't have authority to annul it. If God does not recognize a divorce, then what is remarriage? What is it? What happens? And Jesus says, now we're back in Matthew chapter nine or 5, rather, Chapter 5, I tell you that everyone who divorces his wife, and this goes both directions, okay? It's not just for the man. Uh, it goes, goes both directions. But Jesus is simply speaking to a culture that's so male-dominated. I say that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit 
adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Impermissible divorce and remarriage equals adultery? That's what Jesus is saying. Let that sink in a minute. I mean, Jesus was speaking to a very permissive culture. I imagine there were a lot of jaws that kind of dropped open and mouths went, oh, when he said that. Because probably so many of his audience were divorced. How can he say this? This is shocking. Now, let's just, just walk with what he's saying just a minute. Adultery happens when? At the moment of divorce? No. The remarriage. When you're sexually involved with the new partner. So, Jesus is assuming that a divorcing couple will remarry. Now, that's going to be important in just a moment. But adultery happens on multiple levels. He said, if a man divorces his wife, realize what you're doing. You're multiplying sin because you are going to commit adultery, but you're also going to make your wife commit adultery because she has almost no options to live other than to marry somebody. So she's going to be in adultery. The man that she marries is going to be also in adultery. Do you realize how this just, just sin proliferates here? One more thing I want to point out here. The language has been putting the woman down, elevating the man. All of a sudden, Jesus, with this statement, turns it completely opposite. If the man divorces his wife, except for adultery, he commits adultery. He's now putting the blame on the man so much more. So, what Jesus is getting at is the husband and the wife are equals before God. Third thing Jesus wants us to see, high, whole, high view of marriage, the implications of divorce. Know that Jesus gives an exception. Know that he gives an exception. Do you see what it says there? Everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. Um, what does that word mean, sexual immorality? Is that, the word is porneia in the original uh, Greek language that it was written in here. And you probably recognize the word. The word pornography comes from that. And the implication is that this is, well, the, the term is basically a broad term for basically all categories of sexual sin. Not just adultery, but a lot of categories of sexual sin. And the implication is that this is a hard-hearted, unrepentant attitude that persists in this type of sin. And notice also, he's not commanding divorce. He doesn't say, if that happens, you must. He's simply saying, making an allowance. Now, I've known some people who cannot accept Jesus' words here. Um... I've, I've talked to people, I've, I've read some things written where people argue that, well, this looks like an exception, but it's not. And I look at it, and as I read the explanations and I talk to people, it just sounds like you're doing gymnastics to try to get away from what Jesus says. And we've talked about that in the past. It's dangerous to look at the Scripture and say, yeah, but. If Jesus says something, it's a pretty good idea to take it at face value. And as I've studied, I've, my conviction is he means what he says, that, except the question is then, and I've had this conversation with people too, how could God ever make exceptions to his laws? If God makes a law, there's to be no exceptions, ever, ever, right? No, God's laws intersect with one another. And sometimes one law trumps another one. One law overrules another one. You've got laws against killing. Well, what happens if somebody comes into your home and they're attacking your wife or your kids? There is a provision for self-defense. That's not murder. That's self-defense. Or how about a law about you may not lie, you shall not lie? How about when people have evil intent? You think of Rahab in the city of Jericho uh, when she lied to save the Israelite spies. 
Or you think of people living maybe in Nazi Germany where Nazi soldiers come seeking Jews, and if you're hiding Jews in your house, and they say, do you have any Jews here? You say, well, I can't tell a lie. Right there. I mean, is that really... Are there times when one principle trumps another? Or, for example, the Scripture is saying, submit, we must submit to governmental authority. But what happens if it directly violates another command of God? Like in the, in the book of Daniel, where, where people were, were forced, coerced to worship an idol. And the three young men said, we're not doing it. Ain't happening. Civil disobedience. There's times when one law trumps another. So, I don't see this as a problem. I simply see sometimes one thing trumps another. So then the question, why is adultery an exception? Because the marriage is a one flesh union. When the man and the wife come together, then they consummate that physically with one another. And that is part of coming together. That is part of being one flesh. Well, if one of the partners goes out and becomes one flesh with somebody else, they have completely violated that covenant. Uh, they've broken that vow. They've broken the covenant. They become one with somebody else. And that's the whole concern Jesus has anyway, is an unlawful divorce proliferates adultery if they've done adultery. Furthermore, the Old Testament penalty for adultery was what? Death, which would then free up the other partner to remarry. So, so it seems that, that in many ways it's logical to see why Jesus makes an exception here. Now, the important thing I want to underline here is when it comes to the subject of divorce, remember there are victims too. There are victims. There's people who didn't choose this. I, I, I think of a friend that, that, uh, um, that a friend of my wife and, and mine that, that her husband just walked out on her, walked out on the face, said, I don't want to be married. I don't want the married life. I'm gone, and left her. And she's found another, another man who's a, who's a marvelous Christian man and married him. And, and I believe in that case. God blesses that marriage, and I think he is. So, so realize there's God's truth, but God's also a gracious God in a really difficult world. Now, is adultery the only exception? I believe there's another. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 15, says that if an unbelieving spouse departs, you're not bound. So, so if you're married to a spouse and they're an unbeliever and probably got married before you became a Christian and that person leaves, he says you're not bound. And I've talked with people who say, you're free. I've talked to people who say, well, that means you're free to be single. And I'm going, duh. I mean, why write that? I mean, if your partner's left you, yeah, you're single. Great news, you're free. I think when it's saying free, it's talking about free to remarry. Um, When God allows divorce, I believe he also allows remarriage. And I believe he's assuming that all through this passage, that when there's a divorce, there'll be a remarriage. That's why he's assuming there's going to be adultery as well, if it's an un unlawful divorce. I would think there's one other category that we at least need to talk about, and that's abuse. If a spouse is abusive to another one, or to their kids, or to both, and I've seen one situation that was absolutely horrific um, where the kids' lives were in significant danger. And you've got to at least separate them. But sometimes it gets to a point to where I believe that's also a breaking of a covenant when it gets bad enough. So anyway, those are a couple situations where I think, biblically, I would argue, but I know there's different views as well. And, and, and so, uh, so bring that before the Lord. You may be thinking, what should I do if I was previously divorced on unbiblical grounds? I've gotten remarried since. Does God see me living in adultery now? My answer would be, at this point, repent of past sins. If there are things that God says you need to repent of, do that. Communicate that to loved ones. Communicate that to, to others, maybe family members who have been hurt. And do everything you can to make rest restitution but then live in the situation where you are now to the glory of God and start there. 1 Corinthians 7 talks about people when they come to faith, that's that context, but it's a similar principle. Live where you are to the glory of God. So that would be my answer there. Now there's three applications I want to bring out quickly. 
beware of bending scripture to make it say what we want. I think we are good at that. And I find when I have strong feelings about an issue, and it's very strong, very common with an issue like divorce, we can bend scripture to say what we want it to say. When studying scripture, if I'm aware I've got a strong emotional leaning, what I try to do is to lean the other direction as I'm studying it and interpreting it. Try to see the opposing point of view in a fair light and beware of black and white opinions that make complicated issues very, very simple. Charismatic gifts. I am not wired to where I've not been raised in that kind of a setting. My personality is not such that I'm attracted to that. I don't, I, I'm not attracted to when people, when somebody comes up and they claim to have a prophecy from God. And it would be easy for me to simply say that stuff is no more. And I could find some verses that would seem to indicate that. But in all honesty, there's a few other verses that don't fit as comfortably into that box. And I need to be honest about that. I need to listen to other people's points of view. I've even bought a commentary on 1 Corinthians by a fine charismatic scholar just to try to make sure I'm not leaning so far to one side that I'm missing what the text is really saying. So uh, I have convictions in that matter. But I do believe I need to focus on what's truly important. Christ, righteousness. So that's an example of that. Second lesson, focus on fundamental principles, not exceptions. We talked about that. Focus on God's ideal. Distinguish between the fundamental texts, which are talking about God's plan, and the texts which are intended to regulate problems. The fundamental texts are where we want to focus. Shortly after the COVID lockdown period, I preached a sermon from 1 Peter 2, 13 and following, and it's about submission to governmental authorities. And it is powerful, powerful. I was impressed at how strongly Peter speaks to that issue. And Peter says very bluntly that it is our submission to governmental authorities that is one of the strongest testimonies we have And I made the point that if we have developed uh, a reputation as people who, who obey and submit to governmental authority, then in those rare, rare, rare situations where we might be required to worship an idol or something like that, and we have to say no, it's going to stand out because it's so contrary to everything else we are. After that message, I got question after question after question from people all focused on, but when is it acceptable to rebel against government? When does the government overstep their line? When can we, you know, and, and people talking about, well, there's a conspiracy theory out there, you know, there's, there's conspiracies, they're forcing things on us, they're taking away our freedoms, they're making us take a shot, they're, they're, uh, they're making us, uh, uh, they're, they're going to take away our guns next, and on and on. And at one point I commented, our focus should be on God's main principles, not the loopholes. And it does bother me when I preach the main principle of submission, when the questions are all dealing with loopholes. Civil obedience is the rarest exception. You get what I'm saying? Focus on the principle. Last application. Read the exception concerning divorce in light of the larger context of what Jesus is saying here. What has Jesus said here? Well, one thing he's made very clear is the larger issue is the sanctity of marriage. That's one. The other issue, what has he said back in verse 24 and 25? Reconciling. Reconciliation. Those are two huge things. And so when I read John Stott's commentary on this, uh, he's going to be with the Lord a number of years ago now, but he said his personal conviction as a minister of the gospel was if anybody came in wanting to talk to him about divorce, his policy he would first talk about the permanence of marriage. Not even talk about divorce. We're going to talk about the permanence of marriage. Then we're going to talk about reconciliation. And he would never even mention the D word until he talked about the permanence of marriage, reconciliation. Then maybe talk about divorce after every other attempt had failed. That, that's the first time he would even discuss the issue. Tough passage. Tough passage. Where I want your focus, 
My focus is on the person of Jesus. And as we look at this, Jesus goes through issue after issue after issue after issue. If we were really internalizing this, all of us would be on our knees with tears coming out of our eyes saying, have mercy on me. But the great thing is we serve a Savior who died on a cross for our sins, right? And we all reach out to him and receive his grace. And that unites us together. We're not at different levels and different categories. We're all saved by his blood if we're in Christ. And so focus on him. Give thanks to him. Christ is our righteousness. Rejoice in him and go forth serving him where you are. And if he's calling you to take some actions, take some actions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We look at him, his grace, his truth, his love, and we look at ourselves, products of a fallen human race, and we live in a culture that is so messed up, but we're messed up too. And we thank you for the work you're doing in our hearts. Pray that you continue to do it. Show us your righteousness. Lead us in that path. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.